Truly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hard hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Yes, yes, yes. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. For, you know, hey, listen, the message tonight is I titled it, Are You Hearing Voices? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would use me tonight as a vessel, that you would speak your truth. And that, Lord, we would learn to hear your voice and not the voice of a stranger. We give you glory and honor and thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, I just want to welcome everybody tonight. We've got a few different visitors. And I just want y'all to know that we're happy to have you in the house of the Lord with us tonight. Amen. Amen. So I titled tonight's message, like I said, Are You Hearing Voices? Because Jesus explicitly was talking about the fact that his own sheep, they hear his voice, amen, and they don't hear the voice of a stranger and really just wanted to talk a lot about the voice of God tonight and being able to hear the voice of God. In the text, he also talked about sheep and uh, how the sheep hear his voice, and I kind of wanted to look something up about the difference between sheep and goats. I don't really talk in my message tonight much about goats, but the feeding behaviors of sheep and goats, uh, are, and I had to be careful about this because we have a lady that comes to the church that owns goats, so I didn't want to just go off and say something. So I, I researched a veterinary site, and this is what they claim. They claim that the big difference is that sheep graze Goats kind of browse and graze, meaning they're kind of like look around and they'll try to, you know, they're, they're going to look around and see if they can see something else. But sometimes they'll also eat things that are not really as healthy and don't have as much nutrients, you know. And whereas sheep are very happy to stay to, to certain types of pastures. And another thing, the, the difference between sheep and goats is that sheep, they, they like to be around one another. They feel more comfortable in, a, in staying in a herd, whereas goats are a lot more independent. They'll be happy to just go off by themselves and they've been known to go off in a direction for uh, you know long periods of time or longer distances and it's a little bit harder to keep track of them. I thought that was interesting. You know, the Lord wants us, you know, even in the Psalmist David in Psalm 23, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me, he lead, He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside, beside still waters. I'm paraphrasing because I didn't have it in my notes. But he, he restores my soul. He wants us to lay down in green pastures. He wants us to be in safe places. He wants to give us good nutrition. And I want to talk to you tonight about, about the word of the Lord. Amen. And I, and I think it's important too to, to, to leave with that little testimony I just gave y'all about the sheep. Is that the fact that they like being in the herd. Yeah. The fact that they like being around each other. 
I, I feel like the Lord's been speaking that a lot to us lately, at least in this church and definitely in the little Bible study fellowship part that we've been having and really in the word of God where we've been that the Lord is he said he wants us to love our brothers, right? I keep I almost saying every time he says they're going to know your my disciples for the love that you have for one another. Amen. Amen. And Jesus, he, Jesus proved his love in that he laid down his life. He, what kind of, you know, he, he laid down his life for a friend. Amen. He laid, he laid his life down for us and, and he showed us the way. Amen. And so one of the things though that stuck out to me in that passage of scripture was the word voice. The scripture said, my sheep know my voice okay but before i get into that it's a little late to try to do this but we're going to pretend i'm going over here anybody watching the video and i'm going to get behind this drum cage and i'm going to do an illustration because we're going to pretend that this is the sheep pen all right and and the reality of it is is that in, in this uh, culture that they lived in, there were certain areas of Israel that were good for pasture land and were better for herding, right? And, and in these areas, many, many uh, shepherds would have their various flocks and then they would share, great, allow their animals grazing in different pastures. And then and whenever nighttime came, they would utilize a sheep pen, right? It could have been made of rocks and it would have one opening and they would all put their sheep in there and then the gatekeeper would close the door to protect them. That's what the point of the gatekeeper in the passage is, is for protection, right? To protect the sheep. And, and, then, and then there was a door. Well, Jesus, Jesus said this. He said that any man that comes another way other than the door is a thief and a robber. And he said, he said the shepherd comes through the door, amen, and the, and the gatekeeper opens the door and then he, he knows his sheep by name. And, and it's said that the shepherds would actually be able to call their sheep right. by name and that they would respond. And so that's how they would separate these sheep out. And so basically the door would be open. And then I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of sometimes I'm, I'm trying to make a little light of things. But he said, I don't know, any, many, mighty, mo, come on, fluffy and white as snow or whatever their names were. And they would listen and they would walk out. And then the scripture says, and he would go and lead before them. He wasn't driving. Driving them, you know, you might, in some movies they talk about it. They, let's hire us a drover so he can drive the cattle, so he can so he can drive the herd. But in this scripture, it says that the shepherd leads them, and they follow. Yes, yes. and they hear his voice, and the voice of a stranger. They do not hear. Yes. And I wanted to tell you that that word voice, if you were going to write it in English letters, okay, the Greek word I would imagine is pronounced phone. But interestingly enough, it's where we get our word phone. Isn't that something? The Greek word for voice right there is phone, and it means sound, a sound, a tone of a language, a tongue, or like a musical instrument. And the idea that they're getting at when, when they talk about tone, and I'm not really a musician, but I do know this, the tone of a clarinet is different than the tone of a trumpet. And I do know that people that understand music understand the difference between the, the way a C sounds and a A sounds. And so there's different keys and there are different tones to the sound. And what we're saying here when we talk about the voice is that it's distinguishable. The voice of God should be distinguishable to the sheep, to other Voices, yes, sir. But I have to tell you that many times there's multiple voices that are speaking all at once. And the reality of it is, is this, is that the word of God warned us that in the last days that there would be people that would, they would depart from the faith and they would give heed to seducing spirits because there's going to be multiple voices speaking. And sometimes they cloak or clothe their language with scripture. And it seems as though they're speaking truth. But the reality of it is, is that that they may not be speaking truth. So it's very important that you and I learn how to be a workman that rightly divides the word of truth. Amen. And, and it's not good enough just to come to a church where, where the pastor do, does his best and seeks the face of God and studies and, and presents the word of God. No, no, no. You, you as the sheep have to also dig into the word because look, 
Whenever Paul was preaching the gospel and he went on to Thessalonica and he preached the gospel to them, the Bible says that those in Thessalonica were more noble. Amen. I'm sorry, the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because the Bereans, after Paul preached to them, what did they do? They went home and they studied the things that the apostle Paul said to them to find out for themselves. So how important is it in this day and age that we live in that when I preach to you or if you listen to other preachers that you that you search the scriptures to find for yourself the whole counsel of God. You know, and listen, I'm going to tell you something. It's not good enough just to listen to a bunch of preachers. That's right. I'm going to tell you, it's not good enough. I Listen, I got a lot of little favorite preachers that I listen to. It's not good enough to just listen to a bunch of preachers. It's, it's okay to listen to preachers, but you need to dig it out in the Word of God, and you need to study the Word of God to show yourself approved. Amen? The point that I'm trying to make is to be able to distinguish the sounds of, of the voices, amen, and that comes through the word of God, because look, the Holy Spirit will never contradict the written word of God, the word of God is alive, and it's powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, it divides asunder, joint from marrow, soul from spirit, and it's a discerner of the intents and the thoughts of the heart, but the Holy Spirit will never contradict the written word, that's right, Amen. He says a little bit later in John chapter 10, he said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know, the word hear there means to give an audience and it means to be endowed with the faculty of hearing. To, to consider what is or has been said. Fifteen times in the, in the New Testament, th this wording, something like this, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I got to tell you that Jesus was definitely not, it was not a surprise that Jesus laid hands on a deaf person and they were, they, they got their healing, amen, in the crowds that he was speaking to. But I can promise you that he's, that's not what he's talking about. <laughs> he's not talking about people, uh, uh, whether or not they can hear audiologically, whether or not their hearing is working. He's saying, will you give me your ear? I'm speaking but will you give me your ear and will you hear what I have to say? And he says this, the, well, the word hear, me, hear right here means to be endowed with the faculty of hearing. And I just always try to bring us back to the main concepts of Christianity. And how would you ima imagine that, that you were endowed or given, we can say it like that, that you were given, you were yes, equipped... Yes. With the ability to be able to hear the voice of God, right? How did that happen? Well, when Jesus died on the cross and you heard the good news of the gospel and you yielded by faith, the, the Bible says if you truly are a convert of Jesus Christ, that a miracle happened in your life. And you know what that miracle is? The Holy Spirit moved into your spirit. Your spirit became one with His Spirit. And you became one with the Spirit of God. You have been endowed with the faculty to hear the voice of God. Praise God. I like the way the first, first John 2.19 says this. And uh, we'll read verses 19 through 21 in the ESV. It says, they went out from us. But they were not of us. I read in the NLT version today, this right here, and I get what the translators were trying to do, and, 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 and I'm not opposed to what they did, but they said they, they left our church. <laughs> and and that, while that may be true, I just got to tell you that just whenever people leave a church, it doesn't mean that they left the faith. Yes, right. Yes, yes, yes. At the same time, he is saying that they did. They, these people separated themselves from us. OK. And sometimes that's the case. People are leaving the church, but they're leaving the faith. OK. Or they're believing a different way. They're not believing. And so and he said that the reason that they did that was that because they were of the spirit of Antichrist. And, and, what, and what I want you to know is this, is that the spirit of Antichrist at that point in time, they were basically saying what they were dealing with them was that Jesus had not come in the flesh. But I got to tell you, we were warned in the scripture that in the last days, it was going to be a whole lot of false doctrine out there, right? So we do have to be aware of these things and we have to be careful. But he says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, 
they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Verse 20. But this is the part I wanted you to see. But you have been anointed. This is the ESV version. Okay, the, the King James version says you have an unction from the Holy One. The ESV says you've been anointed by the Holy One and you have all knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. This is just rep repetitious of what I was just telling you. When you got saved, you were endowed with the faculty of healing because when you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved into your heart and you received an anointing from the Holy One and the Spirit of God in you bears witness to with your spirit, amen, that when you're hearing the word of truth, you should be able to have discernment in your spirit. When somebody's trying to tell you something, when somebody's trying to sell you a line of goods, L listen to me though, this is where it gets dangerous, because sometimes the intents of our own heart, the, come on, let me just go ahead and preach, the lust of our own flesh, sometimes want to hear what it is that we want to hear. Sometimes I got a question, and I wrote it in my notes, and I asked the people in the jail today, what is it that people are looking for nowadays when they're looking for a church? I just got a question. I'm not trying to take a fight with nobody, but I got a question. Are they looking for a church that has a cool coffee shop? I'm not opposed to coffee shops. I'm just asking, is that what's driving people to go to church? Are they looking for a church where there's a bunch of single women or a bunch of single men? I'm not opposed to single men and single women meeting single men and single women that love Jesus. But if that's what's driving you to find your church... My friend, we're supposed to be looking for the truth. Amen. Right. And what is it that's driving people right. these days? Because there's so many options. And so many preachers are trying to keep up. Yeah. I have no desire. We got a little, somebody on Facebook, something, contacted us today and said, Hey, I got your mess, I messaged you from <laughs> such and such. And I handle online discipleship and, and I said, look, just be as sweet as you can because he's probably trying to sell something. Say, look, I'm not looking for strategies because he said something about strategy. I'm not looking for strategies and I'm not looking for productivity. We preach in the gospel. We're teaching the gospel. We put it online for some people that like to hear. I'm not in. This is, listen, I'm not trying to run nothing that belongs to the Lord like a CEO of a corporation. I understand this is America. I believe in capitalism. I breathe, believe in free enterprise. But listen, we got to answer to the Lord. And the Lord said, you're going to answer to me for my word. Amen? Amen. And, and we're going to present the word of God. And I hope that the people that have the word, the spirit of God on the inside of them, will, it will bear witness with their spirit and they will be fed the truth of God and they will have a desire to hear the word of God. The voice of God. Yes. What, kind, what, what voices are we hearing, church? You know, listen, there's a passage out of Samuel, 1 Samuel. Hannah, Hannah y'all remember Hannah? Yeah. And her barren womb. That's sometimes that's how I pray. Lord, make, my, make me like the hand is barren womb. That my heart would, that, I, that I'd, feel like I was, I'd feel like I was empty of something because that my heart would cry out for souls, Lord. That my heart would cry out that I would do your will. Make me like Hannah's barren womb. Make me like Rachel's barren womb where I'd cry out and I'd say, Lord, give me children or else I'd die. That I would do your will. Because what? listen to me, church. If we're just playing games, if we're, if we're just doing, putting on some kind of show, then we just soon go to a show somewhere else. But in reality, because God is real and we're going to stand before him. Hallelujah. And he is holy and he is worthy of his glory and his honor. And, and he was there and room was crying out. Y'all remember that? And Eli thought she was drunk. And he, she said, no, sir, don't think of me as, as a daughter of Belial. Uh, like, I, I'm crying out for a child. And, and I mean, if the Lord had given me a child, I'll give him, I'll give him to the house of the Lord. And one of the most beautiful things is she wanted a child, but in the end, it wasn't to meet her own desires. It was instead to please the Lord. And what Hannah probably didn't know is that the reason that the Lord was putting it on her heart to cry out like that is because God was going to need a man that could hear his voice. Because it was a very pivotal time in the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. Very pivotal. Listen to me, church. We are in an extremely pivotal 
pivotal time of human history. Do you, are you with me? Are you, 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 you with me tonight? We're in a very, very pivotal time of human history. Listen, anybody that I talk to shakes their head yes when I ask them, do you think we're in the last of the days? I don't know if that means tomorrow, next week. I don't know if that means in three years. I don't know if it means in ten. I don't know what it means. But I know that we're nearer now than when we first began. And the Lord wants us to understand that we're in a pivotal time and we need more than ever before to be able to hear the voice of God. And there where that little boy was, and she sewed a little ephod and put it on him. It's a little some clothing for a priest. And she dedicated him to the house of the Lord. You remember that? And, and then all of a sudden, and the Bible says that Eli, because see, Eli's sons were wicked. That's what the scripture says. They couldn't have heard the voice of God if God would have rained down on them. Because they were so consumed with their own fleshly desires. And God needed a man to be able to hear. Uh, come, come on. And then all of a sudden, he hears a, something, he hears a voice, and he thinks it's Eli. And little Samuel gets up and says, what did, what did you say? He said, I didn't say nothing, boy, go back to bed. And then it happened again. And then finally, Eli starts to catch on. And he says, son, the Lord's trying to speak to you. Next time you hear it, tell him, your servant hears, Lord. Speak. Amen. And what I'm just going to fast forward in the story because... The people of God. See, this is the time frame of the judges. And if you read the judges, the people, they go up on mountaintops and then they fall into the valleys. They go up on mountaintops and then they fall into valleys. The scripture says there was no king. Three different times in the book of Judges, there was no king in those days and the people did what was right in their own eyes. And then finally the people look at the other nations and they say, we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. I want to drive a nicer car. I want... Now, I'm always make fun of crown molding. I got crown molding in my house. But I'm trying to make a point. If you begin to idolize material possessions, those are the thorns that choke out the word of God. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching, I'm preaching better tonight than what you're amen in. It's not that it's me, but it's the truth. And listen, the thorns are the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches. They will wrap around the seedling of the gospel of Jesus. And it will do a chokehold on the seed of the gospel will do a chokehold on the truth of God's word in your life. Don't let the cares of the world get a hold of you. Don't let the deceitfulness of riches get a hold of you. But anyway, the people wanted what they wanted. What was my point to that? Sometimes we want what we want. The people wanted what they wanted. And he said, well, see, if you would have waited on me, and he told Samuel, he said, listen, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Yes, that's right. They don't want me to be their king. Yes. Right? And, 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 oh, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Come on. Yes. If a preacher would have a backbone today and understand that if people are rejected, if he's preaching the truth, as long as he's preaching the truth, that sometimes people might reject the truth and they're not necessarily rejecting him. So he doesn't have to necessarily be like Jeremiah and start worrying about what the people are thinking, but instead worry more about what God thinks. Come on. In this seeker sensitive environment that we're living in, when we get to more worried about what the people are going to think, then we're worried about what the Holy Spirit thinks. Lord, help us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And, and so, so the people said, we want a king. And so they gave Saul. He said, I'll give him a king. I'll give him a king, but they're not going to like the results of it. Amen. And then the time came whenever Saul had done what he had done and God had rejected him. And then the Lord goes and he finds Samuel. He says, how long are you going to mourn for him? Stand up, fill your horn with oil, and I'm going to have you go anoint one of Jesse's <coughs> sons in Bethlehem. And they go through the whole story. And as soon as Samuel walks up, he sees the first son, Eliab. See, the Bible says Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else in the camp. Eliab was tall like that too. Good looking man. Typically, that's what they were looking for in a king. I don't know why, but that's what they were looking for in a king. And all of a sudden, it says, the scripture says, when Samuel saw him, he thought in his heart, surely this is the Lord's anointing. And immediately the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, do not, this is not the one, basically. He said, you do not look at his stature, how tall he is. You do not look at his countenance. Man looks at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. 
So many times you and I, and listen, what a mouthful. Listen, if we, if the, if God is so good, I was just thinking earlier when I was, I was like, wow, Lord, I was about to get excited in my room. I was reading. I was like, wow, what, what a swerve. I mean, God shows up in the midst of ancient Israel history and he allows this situation to take place to say that one statement, man looks at the outward appearance, but I'm looking at the heart and now it rings true through the annals of human history to all believers of all ages that would read the word of the Lord and we have to come to the conclusion that God is not concerned with the outward appearance of things but yet we are so consumed so concerned with the outward appearance of things and he says I'm looking at your heart I want to examine your heart I want to have a sit down with you and let's talk about your heart because Peter said, and I preached it the other day, sanctify the Lord Jesus in your heart. Make a special place for him. Separate him out. He's holy. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes. That people, when they, they would ask, where does this joy come from in your life? Why are you different than the people that I know? Why are you not laughing at my joke, bro? Why, why you don't go with us? Da, 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 da. Because. I'm sit by the grace of God. I'm not here to, uh, but by the grace of God, I'm sanctifying Jesus in my heart. Yes, yes. I'm done with that old stuff. And I've a couple ones. I done traveled down that road. I done been around the corner a time or two. I just kept getting left empty. Kept digging a deeper pit for myself and falling in. And I got good news for you tonight. If you've been anything like me in the past and you kept digging a ditch for yourself and falling into it, I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus has set you free. The word of God says that when that cross was eaten up, more than enough, that he broke the power of sin. Hallelujah. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Praise God. You're free tonight. You know what you got to do, though, is you got to get your head right. <laughs> Come on. That's why you got to renew your mind. Yes. Your mind has to line up with the truth that's already in you. Right. Yes. Truth in you is that you're free. You're a new creation Hallelujah. in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He's looking at the insides. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So when it's all said and done, so he needed a king. I'm sorry. He needed a prophet that could properly hear. I mean, this is David, King David, the type of. And forerunner of Jesus. Wow. He, he, he didn't have time to be playing around with these other false prophets that are running around saying it. And they don't have anything on their mind but their own agenda. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. It's time for us to. to look, I said, are we on the same frequency? We got to tune in. You know, I used to draw something a long time ago. I don't, I don't even know where my little. Thing is, I used to draw something a long time ago, like with my stick man, right? And uh, and then I would have something like this. These are supposed to be the eyes of God. Just give me, just deal with it. Help me out. And then we'll just act like this is a. I thought about if I would have drawn something like this today, because because the word phone, 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 right here, uh, voice, right? And I was thinking, the Lord, the Lord. He's wanting to talk to us, yeah. right? And I used to do it like this, where where there was some type of a of a transmitter, and then and then and then you had a receiver. This is supposed to be kind of like a satellite. And what I wanted to say is, is that God's always transmitting a signal. You, you understand what I'm saying? The signal is going out. The the gospel is going forward. The word of God is, is going forward. The truth of God's word is always going forward. The question is, do we have our dial tuned to the right frequency? Are we wanting to hear the voice of God? Or are we wanting to hear something that is going to be pleasant to our own ears? Help us, Lord. Amen. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Deception comes in, right? You remember the story about, about Esau and Jacob? And, and, and what did Isaac say? He said, 
the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are Esau's hands. Y'all remember that story that Esau done put fur on him trying, I mean, Jacob put fur on him trying to act like he was Esau because Esau was all hairy. And, and I mean, it's just straight up deception in the families of God. And I got to tell you that there's been many of people that have operated under a spirit of deception. It sounds kind of right, but it don't feel right. L let us run. Let us flee if it's not lining up with that unction and that anointing that has been placed on the inside of us. Why would we play around with it? Help us, Lord. Yes, Lord. Help us, Lord. Genesis 3, 17, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Because you have listened to the voice of his wife, of your wife. Now listen, men, I'm not sitting here and telling you don't listen. Don't ever listen to your wife. Don't get that out of my preaching. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to make a point. Adam, listen to a different voice. If your wife's voice is lining up with the voice of the Lord, then listen to your wife's voice. If your wife's voice is not lining up with the word of God, don't listen to your wife's voice. Don't listen to your boss's voice. Oh, what you talking about? No, if your boss is asking you to do something that is contrary to the word of God, then you don't listen to your boss's voice. If you, come on. Right? I mean, would you, oh, if the government, well, what about the government, Pastor? Uh, the Lord said to obey the authorities. Well, there's going to be one day for some people, whoever they are, that the government is going to tell them stuff that they ought not listen to. Come on. If, if, if the voice that you're hearing is telling you something different, don't listen to it, right? Look what it says in Genesis 22. He says this to Abraham. He said, and in your offspring... Shall all nations of the earth be blessed? Why? Because you have obeyed my voice. You know what that story is? The Bible says this in Genesis 22, 18. It says, it says that Abraham laid wood on the lad's back. I mean, you can't get better than this. 2,000 years before Jesus is ever born, a father with a supernaturally born son. Come on, Abraham was 99, Sarah was 90. And then when it comes time, the father says to him, let me take your son upon a mountain that I will show you and there you will sacrifice him. And the Bible says he laid wood on the lad's back and that, 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 that young man willingly walked up that hill to be offered as a sacrifice. And at the last moment, the Lord provided a ram in the thicket. Jehovah Jireh became the name of that mountain. Jehovah Jireh. Amen. God, my provider. I got good news for you. The Lord stayed the hand of Abraham. And, and listen, this is what I believe. This is Matt Abraham's commentary. I'll always tell you when I'm giving you commentary. I believe that the Lord said, this is what he said. You don't have to do it because that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer up my son on a hill called called Calvary. I'm going to offer him up as a sacrifice for my people. And because you have obeyed my voice, Abraham, your offspring is going to be blessed through the ages. Because his offspring became Israel, and Israel gave the world Jesus. And those that will look to Jesus are blessed. Amen. It can't be talking about the nation of Israel. <clears throat> You can't, you can't be talking. As a matter of fact, we know he's not talking about the nation of Israel because the Apostle Paul cleared it up for us. That's right. In Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul said he didn't say seeds as many, but seed as of one. And that seed is Christ. So the Apostle Paul made it clear that the blessing that was given to Abraham was not for the seeds known as the nation of Israel, but the one seed, which is Jesus. Yes. As a matter of fact, if we look at the situation right now, Israel's a thorn in everybody's side. <laughs> right? I'm not saying come against Israel, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm trying to make a point. The blessing promised to Abraham was ultimately Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. He goes on to say in Exodus to the nation of Israel. Now they've become a nation in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. He says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Look at that. Verse 5, if you will indeed obey my voice. 
Obey his voice is what he's saying. He said, you're going to be a holy nation. And now I just preached this. I think it was last Sunday. I'm pretty sure. First Peter chapter two, verse eight. It's starting in verse eight. It said, because I'm talking about people hearing the voice of God. He says, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He's talking about Jesus right there. You know, Jesus all by himself is really offensive. Come on. The world is offended by Jesus right now. Yes. I'm going to tell you right now because, see, the real Jesus and the real word of God is not okay with everything that's going on in the world. That's right. Y'all, y'all, are, we, are we on the same page here? God is, God is not Jesus. Jesus died to set people free from the bondage of sin. He did not die for everybody to just live in sin and act like it's all okay. That's not, what, that's not why he died. And, he, and so I got to tell you that Jesus is a stumbling block to, to sinful man. Jesus is a stumbling block to religious man. Jesus is just a rock of offense because when the truth of the gospel reaches in, listen, it's important for Christians, true Christians to understand this. Sometimes you're going to hear something that doesn't feel good. Whenever the word of God goes forth, sometimes you hear something that kind of like it penetrates. It pierces, right? That's good. (laughs) That's a good thing. You don't want to run from that. Let me explain that to you. That's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit wants to deal with your heart. He wants to deal with my heart. That's why I let other people preach. Hallelujah. Believing that they're going to say something that's going to pierce my heart. That I'm going to get alone in the presence of the Lord. And I'm going to ask him to pierce my heart. Because I want to hear the conviction. There's been times in my life that I haven't felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you think you're fine. And I'm telling you right now, that is a scary place to be, Christian. Yeah. You don't want to be there. You want to let the Holy Spirit bring you to the place of conviction. And when you realize what he's speaking, you bring that to the Lord and you say, Lord, have your way in this area of my life. I believe that you sent your son to die for this. Holy Spirit, put this on the cross and give me resurrection power in his place. Amen. And the Lord will do the work. Praise God. That's just an example of something that I pray sometimes. Whenever the Lord reveals something to me. Because I know Jesus did it. Anyway. They stumbled because, in verse 8, the rest of it, they stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. But look at this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Again, they disobeyed the word, right? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. It, like this say Apostle Paul. Listen here, young Timothy. You're a pastor of a church. You have some great responsibility in your life. People are going to despise your youth. But I'm here to tell you that you have to preach the word. Amen. Preach the word. Be ready. Amen. Reprove, rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears i use this scripture a lot right because it's a warning about the last days and they will turn away their ears from the truth and they will be turned to fables but you watch in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of your ministry again he's saying i charge you young pastor you want to do these things because the lord is coming back and he's coming back to judge I know I keep saying that because the Lord keeps reminding me of it. Going back to judge you, son, based upon how you handled my business. As a pastor, how are you handling my business? Amen. He's coming back to judge those that are alive and dead. The things that you speak and the things that they hear will make a difference in the judgment and make a difference in your lives. I believe that. I believe that that when the truth goes forth, see, this is what I believe. Because, and I'm also praying for you. Whoever you are that shows up, I'm praying for you. And I'm believing that the truth of the word of God, when it goes forth, if you will receive it, amen, that the Holy Spirit is going to move on it. And that he is going to begin to change 
things in your life that you couldn't change yourself. Yes. You've been hearing testimonies from people yes. where the Lord's showing up and doing things oh. in their lives, things that they could have never done. Amen. The Holy Spirit does the work, my friend. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit. I mean, the word repro reprove means to convict, to convince. Well, one of those words to describe reprove, it means, it means to prove that a person or an opinion is wrong. <laughs> to prove, so sometimes you got to stand up and you got to let people know, no, 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 that's not right. I'm, and I'm about to share something with you here in a moment before it's over with. Sometimes we got to stand up and say, to admonish means to warn or reprimand someone firmly. That's all part of reproving. Yes, yes. The word rebuke means to warn or reprimand or to forbid. There are certain things in the word of God that are forbidden. That's right. To, uh, one of them means to express severe disapproval in a formal statement. You got to just sometimes say it, preacher. Right? Help us, Lord. Also to exhort. Now that the word yes. exhort come, is this almost like the same word that we have for holy for the comforter. The, the word comforter is paraclesis in the Greek. The word exhort is parakaleo, to call close, to call alongside, to call near. When we call people to come near to the truth, the Holy Spirit will console, encourage, and strengthen, and comfort. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. As you line up to the truth, he begins to do great things in your life, my friend. Yes. I want to just encourage you. Yes, he does. Amen. There's plans of the enemy to distort the voice of God and to prevent the truth. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18. I'm not going to really break it down a lot, but it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The idea is that there are ungodly people on the earth that are suppressing the truth. Yes. And I got to tell you something. This is the real danger. I know for a fact that there, listen, I don't want to take too much time with this, but one of my hobbies is actually studying church history. Consider it a hobby because uh, I love to understand some things. Listen, some things have happened in the church over the last 15, 20 years that I have been alive. I got saved in the 80s. The church world has drastically yes. changed. Yes, it has. Something called the seeker sensitive movement came on the scene, and I'm not going to sit here and name call people because I used to do that all the time. And I'm kind of, I'm not saying I'll never do it, but I'm not doing it tonight. And in California, they went and knocked on doors. And I know I say this a lot, but I want to remind you of something. This literally happened 15, 20, 25 years ago. It was the start of the mega church movement. And they went knocking on doors. And, and what they said was to the public, what can we do to make church more comfortable for you? Dim the lights, get a strobe light, take off the choir robes, make the pre don't preach quite as long, preacher. Don't preach. I don't know. Make us feel good. I don't know. Don't preach on sin. Don't, yeah, they didn't want the word cross. And that's what started happening. They started removing the word cross from songs, removing the word cross, removing blood. All that was happening 15, 20 years ago. And, 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 and well, next thing you know, churches started kind of filling up because people started preaching on things that they felt like they needed to hear. And I'm not saying that every big church that has people in it is, is doing that. That's not what I'm trying to get at. But it changes the culture. And, and people begin to want to hear. I don't. Well, I don't know about all that. That's that. He, that guy's not preaching it like these other people. I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about all that. No, no, that's how they preach the gospel. That's how Paul preached the gospel. That's how Peter preached the gospel. The word preach means to be a herald. It means to be a public crier to cry the truth, to warn people, to let them know. And if there's ever been a time to warn people and let them know, now is the time. Yes. But men suppress the truth and they hold it down in unrighteousness. And I'm here to tell you, I know for a fact, preachers have been doing that. I then flew to the, to the cities where the big denominations have their national conferences and rubbing shoulders with some of these people in here and how they talk. And I know for a fact 
that this is what's going on because they're fearful. And what they focus on is how many people, hey, what you running, bro? Yeah, with the kids or without the kids? And, they, and, and they're like, they, they go, oh, man, you're doing good, dude. 500, wow, you're really bumping up there, man. Things are going good. That's a problem, church. Right. We need to be aware of this. Help us, Lord. Yeah. Look at Jude verses chapter one. Well, there's only one chapter. <laughs> Jude three and four. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful, needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly Contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Wow. Look at that. It was needful for me to write to you and exhort you that you would earnestly contend for the faith. When it's, a, it's a compound word in the Greek, but the first word is where we get the word agony from. Agino is on my. It, the idea is, is that you're wrestling with it. You're, you're, you're fighting for it. You're contending for the faith. Because see, every one of these Bible writers, except for maybe James, warned us that in the last days, and even in those days, there were false prophets, false teachers, teaching things that were wrong. And it spreads like gangrene. And it spreads like yeast. What did Jesus say? The, the pay, you know, don't, about the doctrine of the, the leaven of the Pharisees. He said about the leaven of the Pharisees and his, and his disciples were like, what is he talking about? That we didn't bring any bread? He's like, no, he's talking about the false teachings of the religious leaders. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven is yeast. It spreads. Yeast spreads through the whole batch and it takes over. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of false doctrine is not good. Lord, help us yeah. that we don't do that. Amen. That word delivered means to give into the hands of another, to take care of, <clears throat> to earnestly contend. The gospel that was delivered unto us, it was placed in our hands and God expected that we would take care of it. That's why being a preacher is not a job, my friend. It's a calling. Yes, yes. That's right. That's right. You either called or you're not. And, and, and I mean, it, a lot of people are making a good living at it. And a lot of people are blessed by their churches and, and all that good stuff. But I'm just saying, and I'm not saying that some of those people aren't truly called. But it's not really a job. It's a calling. Yes. You know, I, man, I think about, I thought about this. Because, look, the Apostle Paul, the Bible says he, he delivered. Or I'm saying it like this. He delivered it to Phoebe. The letter to the Roman church. I can only imagine when he, Phoebe, your trusted sister in the Lord, there's nobody else I can trust with this letter with you. You're about to sail through the Mediterranean Sea and the people in Rome have to get this letter. I'm entrusting it to you. Now, people can say whatever they want about women in ministry, but I'm here to tell you right now, I got saved under a woman in ministry and I Amen. thank God for women in ministry. Amen. They got some women are some of the most faithful followers of God. I got to I got to be honest with you. Women are oftentimes not all women. I'm not I'm not well, women tend to be more faithful than men. We had a, in our conversation the other night, women are susceptible to deception and we see that through Eve. But women are faithful. Amen. Now, and listen, ain't nobody faithful without the help of the Holy Spirit. Come on now. Help me out here. I'm talking about the help of the Holy Spirit. But but a woman on fire for the Lord. He didn't put that in Timothy's hands. He put it in Phoebe's hands. And thank God Phoebe got the job done because we got the letter to the Roman church. I'm just saying. Delivered and trusted. Amen. Look, I'm about to close this out. Did God say? What voice was that? You know that passage of scripture in Matthew 4, and 2, 4 2 through 4? I'm about to hit you with something because look, the world's speaking too. You got false prophets speaking, but you also got the world speaking, and the world speaks in through through various ways, right? Help me out. The world speaks at the water cooler at work. The world speaks. The world speaks on the radio. I know. I talk too much about secular music. Come on, just love me for who I am. <laughs> I, listen, I was a Christian for twelve years, listening to secular music, so it's not like I didn't do it. The world speaks through Hollywood's agenda. 
Do they not? I'm not trying to tell you. I never watch no movies. The world, the world's speaking. Amen. All right. The tempter came to him in Matthew chapter four when he was hungry and said, "If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become." loaves of bread. But what did Jesus say? He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Yes. Now I had a purpose for that. And I'm going to close with this. Y'all remember that song way back in the 80s? See, I used to research some crazy stuff. I wrote a book about some crazy stuff a long time ago. But Y'all remember that song back in the 80s, uh, We Are the World? Yes. Yeah, that was a big old hit, right? Yes. Everybody singing that song together, right? So, so what I wanted to tell you, I just pointed out a couple of little things of the song because we're not going to sit here and read the whole thing and give glory to the song. But the premise of the song was that we were going to feed people in Africa. And listen, I don't have a problem with feeding hungry people in Africa. So don't please, don't put, because Jesus said <laughs> to feed the hungry. And Jesus said to visit those in prison. And Jesus said to clothe the naked. But you also need to understand something that's called the spirit of Babel. That's what I call it. The spirit of the Tower of Babel. And it's man helping man without God in the plan. You understand what I'm coming from? I'm, man helps man, but they have do not have God in their society. And that is an ugly spirit that is going to come against the church coming soon to a theater near you. <laughs> This is what they said. There comes a time when we heed a certain call. When the world must come together as one. Okay, you're going to you're thinking already. Oh, my gosh, this pastor is a conspiracy theorist. Where are we going with this? When the world must come together as one, there are people dying. Oh, and it's time to lend a hand to life. The greatest gift of all. What is the greatest gift of all? Jesus. Eleven times, this is what it repeats in the song. We are the world. I don't even, I meant not to do the melody because it'll be stuck in the head. <laughs> we are the world. We are the children. Is that right? Is that what the gospel says? Nope. What does the gospel say? Does the gospel say that all of creation is God's children? No. Do people tell you that on the outside of the church? Yep. Yes. When you're working with them? Yep. We're all God's children. No, no, ma'am. No, sir. We're all God's creation, yes, but we're sir. not all God's children. Amen. What manner of love Amen. is this that he has bestowed upon us that we would be called the sons of God? And to them that believed in his name, yes. he gave them power yes. to become the sons of God. So if you're going to be a son of God, you're going to be born again. Yes. You're going to be converted. You're going to go the way of the Lord. You're That's going to right. go through the door. Hallelujah. Yes. You're going to go through the one that went through the door of the good shepherd. Amen. Eleven times they said that. Eleven times they said this. There's a choice we're making. This is what they're. This is the choice they're making. Y'all ready? We're saving our own lives. And they sing in that 11 times. We are the world. We are the children. There's a choice we're making. We're saving our own lives. We're all a part of God's great big family. And the truth you know, love is all we need. There it is. That's it. The love. Yep. Do we have some? Are we going to be able to play a song tonight? Yeah. yeah. Okay, singers, musicians. Y'all can come, and I want to just, I want to close that song out with this, because that's not the punchline. Y'all ready for the punchline? If you singers want to hear the punchline, here it is. You ready? As God has shown us by turning stones to bread, and so we all must lend a helping hand. Hold on a second. Wait, what? What did he say? As God has shown us by turning stones to bread. Is that what God did? Is that what Jesus did? What God are they talking about? Well, we are the world. We are the children. Who's the prince of this world? Who's the God of this world? Who did Paul say? If, the, if the, their eyes are blinded to our gospel, they are blinded because of the God of this world. They sing the song and then we're, they write the song and then people are just singing the song with them and they don't even realize and they're like, yeah, God showed us by turning stones. God didn't know Jesus didn't turn those stones into bread. Jesus said that, that man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm here to tell you there's voices speaking, my friend. Yes. And, and that's just a little small snippet of it. This stuff been going on from the ages. 
And it's time that we get savvy. It's time that we get sober. And it's time that we get, get into the word of God and that we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in our heart. And that we allow the truth to have its way in us. Amen. Let's stand tonight as they sing us a song. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.